Deep in the jungle of central Vietnam, there's a wonder of the world. Wow, that is amazing. A lost universe that hides a unique ecosystem. It doesn't happen anywhere else on this planet. I think that's just about the holy grail for a biologist. And a team of scientists and explorers with a mission. This is an amazing cave. Look at that. Absolutely staggering. To investigate a record-breaking contender for the world's biggest cave. Wow. <laughs> Vietnam's Mountain River Cave, or Han Song Dong, is uncharted territory. And next to no one has forged the depths of this monstrous cave. The team of pioneers is here to prove that this cave is the largest in the world. This is an absolutely amazing cave. It's huge. That We're just in the entrance now. It's going to get so much bigger. That's amazing. Absolutely wonderful. This is definitely a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I'm so excited about being here. Practically the first person to set foot into the cave. It's, it's a wonderful opportunity. In 2009, caver Jonathan Sims was one of the first humans ever to enter here. But deep into the long cave passage, he was stopped short by a forbidding rock face. Now he's back with caving expert and expedition leader Howard Limbert. He brings more advanced climbing equipment and a commitment to reach the top of the wall. The expedition begins with a dangerous 328-foot rappel into the first massive cavern. British caver Howard Limbert has led 12 expeditions to Vietnam's limestone caves. This year's expedition into Mountain River Cave is especially dangerous because it's so remote. Well, yeah. Anybody can fall, twist their ankle, break their ankle, that, that could happen. And if that happens, you know, then we've got a rescue on our hands. Rope free, Annette. German zoologist Annette Betcher is anxious to enter the unique underground world within. Scientific opportunity and a caving opportunity as well at the same time. It's fabulous. Daryl Granger is here to unravel the mysteries of Mountain River Cave. He's a world expert in cave geology. If this is the world's biggest cave, he wants to know how it grew to such record-breaking size. It's like no other cave I've ever been to. Southeast Asia is famous for its limestone geology, dating back 450 million years. Many large caves litter Vietnam, but here within Kaibang National Park, Mountain River Cave is certainly the giant among caves. In the 2009 expedition, Limbert and his team were only able to fully explore the first section of the cave. But they found areas they estimated to be about 500 feet wide and about 650 feet high. That's over three times the height of Niagara Falls. Deer Cave in Sarawak, Malaysia, currently holds the title World's Biggest Cave. From what they saw last time, Limbert's team is convinced this cave may be bigger. Let's try and get the map of the cave in some sort of order. Yeah, to claim the world record, they need hard evidence. All this is unmeasured. That's why we've got to survey it, to find, you know, just how big it is, whether it is the biggest cave in the world. We've got to do a serious survey. This passage here for surveying, it was really, really hard work. It was Jonathan hard. Sims is one of the four cavers who drew up this rough original survey of Mountain River Cave. And what we really need to do next is get over this wall. He knows the wall that defeated him back in 2009 is their biggest challenge. It's a dangerous obstacle to overcome. Made of loose calcite and mud, it stands at nearly 50 feet high. We, we just weren't expecting anything like that. Well, as well as that. Sims is determined that this trip will be a success. He won't fail twice. They can climb this forbidding wall. He's convinced that the enormous cave continues on. And as a backup, there's this static sun, which didn't look particularly uh, potable. They estimate the wall is about three miles into the cave. 
from the 328-foot rappel at the entrance. It will take the team half a week to reach the final survey point at the Great Wall of Vietnam. After the initial drop, there's an 1150-foot scramble leading to the first of two river crossings. From here, the team needs to climb high following the river through the natural valley of the cave. Then there's a descent down to a level sandy area and to the first of two dolines. Collapsed holes in the cave's surface. The dolines and cave beyond are where Betcher hopes to find new life forms and Granger the secret of how the cave was formed. Then, through a narrow section, across the larger Dolene, and into the second camp. So far, the final part of the cave surveyed is the last quarter mile before the Great Wall of Vietnam. And then, it's into the unknown. Limbert's caving team has been exploring Vietnam caves since 1990. They picked the Kebang Massif for a very good reason. It's a huge limestone area with lots of water, ideal ingredients for cave formation. Where there's no limestone, the rivers are trapped within walls of non-soluble rocks, which hold the water in. But when it does find an exit, the results can be spectacular. The volume and power of the water help create these gigantic caves. At a monsoon climate, with heavy downpours feeding the many rivers here, and the chances of water carving out a colossal cave are even greater. So far, they've discovered 62 miles of caves, but none as epic as this. They suspect additional factors must be at work here. The team needs to navigate difficult broken terrain to reach their first camp. They're nearly a third of a mile into the cave, with 65 feet to go before reaching a powerful river. This river runs like a main artery through the first part of the cave. At its lowest, 353 cubic feet of water pour by this point every second. It carved this enormous cave, and the team will have to navigate it twice. Limbert leads the way. Oh, some evidence of uh, a bit of water comes through here at times. A bit slippy on these. Yeah. Oh, I can see the river. Whoa! Look at this. This is our river crossing. Oh, then we're underwater. Yeah. Determined to move forward, they must cross the deep, threatening underground river. It's the last bit that looks a bit quick. So if I go up there and belay you, and then you can walk across there, and probably it looks like you've got to climb up in that crack there. Couple of volts this side, couple of volts the other. It's life and death, really. So, I mean, it has to be right. Worst case scenario, one of these pops, you've got to back up. That's why you've got to put, you know, as, uh, make it as safe as possible, really. In full flow, the river could sweep any one of the cavers off their feet. And if it floods, it could rise to life-threatening heights, cutting off their escape route. What's the forecast for the next few days? Well, the forecast is good, but you can never be absolutely confident. Limbert chose the timing of the expedition very carefully. It's the end of the dry season, so the river is low. But any unexpected tropical downpour could cause the river to rise dramatically in just hours. Let's do it! Right, guys, you can start crossing! Next one! The most important thing is that you, that you don't allow the river to sweep you away because there's a load of rapids just down there and we're not really quite sure exactly what's in the river beyond that because we haven't seen it all the way and there could be there could be all sorts of very sharp rocks and all that kind of thing 
and the last thing you want is to get swept down the river because it could be serious injury or even life-threatening. I'm actually quite nervous about river crossings because I'm a, quite a slight build and I've been in flooding caves before where when you put your hands on something, your legs just get swept away from underneath you and you can't get them back down on to get footing. It is actually really, really dangerous. I'll put a passive block here. Hold on. A major obstacle conquered. Daryl Granger can now start to really look around. You can see big formations, big stalagmites over there. Check that one out. This is an amazing cave. We came down those big slopes, we've come through the rocks, and we finally made it down to river level. So now we can uh, set up camp here. We can start thinking about what we want to do next in this cave. The Titanic cave is theirs to explore. What is it that makes a cave so big? There's a lot of stories that we can learn from this cave. To claim the world record, Mountain River Cave needs to be consistently higher, wider, and longer than the current title holder, Deer Cave in Sarawak, Malaysia. When you're talking about largest caves in the world, there's no doubt there's some very, very long caves. And if you went on pure volume, many, many caves are bigger than this cave on pure volume. It's pure dimensions of a whole single passage like this that continues for five kilometers is pretty unique in the world. Mountain River Cave runs in an unusually straight line from north to south without any deviation. So let's get underway. Let's get started. OK? OK. Granger believes the water in the oldest section of the cave could offer an explanation as to why this cave is so enormous. Highly erosive, extremely acidic water rushing over pure limestone may be the answer. To confirm his theory, Granger needs to draw a sample. Okay, so right now I'm taking a pH measurement. I have a pH probe here. We have to leave it in the water for a little while to equilibrate. That'll tell us the, the pH of this water. pH levels range from 0 to 14. The lower the pH number, the stronger the acid. To be out of the ordinary, Granger is looking for a reading lower than 7, which is neutral. On the surface, tropical rainstorms flood the vegetation and seep down through the soil. Along the way, the water picks up carbon dioxide, which makes it acidic. High levels of acidity would make the water flowing into Mountain River Cave more effective at seeping its way through the rock. All right, so my pH should be uh, finished now, and we have about uh, pH 7.5. So that's pretty typical, maybe a little bit on the low side. The results of the test surprise Granger. The water here is not overly acidic. This can't be the explanation for the cave's epic size. There's something strange going on here, and finding the answer to this huge puzzle is his primary focus. Ranger needs to dig deeper. The explanation could lie in the river's efficiency at eroding the limestone. To test this theory, he measures how much dissolved calcium carbonate there is in the water. This will tell him how much rock erodes daily. I'm going to add some acid in here until the liquid turns yellow. And then the way this kit works, I can just read off from the syringe how much calcite is in this water. One more drop. So now it's yellow. Okay, we've got it. We only have about 62 milligrams per liter. This means that every 1,000 gallons of water that passes by here carries eight ounces of dissolved rock, about the size of a baseball, each second. It sounds like a staggering amount, but for a cave of this size, it amounts to nothing. Like the pH level, the calcium carbonate result is ordinary and unexceptional. It's exactly the result a geologist might expect to find in any limestone cave river. 
These results don't help Granger understand why this cave is such a monster. The answers must lie deeper within the cave. Howard Limbert's team is a third of a mile into Mountain River Cave. They have food for six days, enough to get to the Great Wall of Vietnam and back. The team sets up camp. Rehydrating and replacing lost calories has to be carefully managed. Geomorphologist Dr. Hugh Muen and biologist Dr. Tai Muen of Hanoi University also join Limbert on the expedition. Hopefully the other porters will take all the other bags to our underground camp. Oh. This is a great trip. It's an amazing group. And everybody has pulled more than their weight. Annette Betcher goes deeper and further into the cave, looking for life. And like Granger, she's getting frustrated in her search. She is here to find undiscovered species, but so far only sees a barren landscape. It's a bit of a shame. I had great expectations, but with the wet flooding, I um, had to rethink, basically, my approach. The team is exhausted and settles down for their first night inside the cave. The next morning, they continue over half a mile further. Daryl Granger has explored some of the largest caves in the world. But this one is about to reveal something he's never seen before. Deep in the heart of Mountain River Cave lie the magical and mysterious domains. <laughs> wow. Here, the cave roof has collapsed inwards, allowing sunlight to flood in, connecting above and below ground with the vital ingredients of life, water and light. Man, this is the world's biggest cave. The rest of this stuff is just, is just building up to it. That is amazing. That's one and a half kilometers away. That is huge! <laughs> but that looks like, you know, it's a hundred meters away, like we're in a, a normal-sized cave. That's a kilometer and a half. It, it's just, it's hard to even imagine how big that passage is. Here, a unique mini-jungle has taken root, a quarter of a mile below the surface of the Earth. Seeing the jungle basically in the middle of the caves is one of the most beautiful sights. Uh, it's just absolutely incredible. It's got to be one of the wonders of the world. It doesn't happen anywhere else on this planet. I think that's just about the holy grail for a biologist. For Granger, the Dolene is an unexpected window into the structure of the limestone here. It's also a view of Mountain River Cave's Achilles' heel. This is a, a good example of a special type of doline. This is a collapsed doline. So that happens when you have a cave passage and then the surface collapses into that cave. And it happened here because we have really thin beds. Uh, you can sort of see them on the back side of the wall. And they're just not strong enough to hold up this cave roof. At some point in the cave's past, the river ate away at the cave roof where the limestone beds are thinner. The river damaged the ceiling rock so much that eventually the roof collapsed. This collapse is known as cantilever failure. You can think about, uh, theoretically at least, having a, a piece of rock sticking out like a diving board. You can only stick it out so far before it breaks off under its own weight. And that's exactly what happens. As you make the cave bigger and bigger, you're forcing basically a diving board of rock, a slab of rock to stick out and support its own weight. The limestone beds in this part of Vietnam are especially thick with very few cracks or weak points. 
The river tunnels through this landscape, challenging the strength of pure limestone. And the dolines brutally reveal the few places where the rock beds are thinner, weaker, but still divine. Here, open to the sun and the rain, life thrives. Dr. Tai Muen and Annette Betcher are the first to climb into the undergrowth. She's eager to tap into Muen's expertise in rainforest plant species to figure out how this subterranean wonderland compares with the surface. After disappointments in the first part of the cave, the Dolene fulfills Betcher's expectations. Here is an area rich with life a unique and unexplored ecosystem. This is absolutely fantastic. It's a treasure trove for biologists. And everything that lives here has got here by complete chance. So birds have dropped seeds, plants have sprouted up. And this species outside is evergreen. Okay. Just, but here it's a fallen down the leaf in the winter, I think so. Okay, so you think and it's evergreen outside, but it's deciduous in here. And yeah. so the, the young leaves, are those the, the red leaves? Are yeah. those young leaves? Okay, right. Betcher had so hoped to find new species of plants evolved to flourish in this strange underground world. But Muen doesn't see examples of unique evolution. Instead, he thinks the plants in the Dolene are showing extreme adaptation. It's a process known to biologists as phenotypic plasticity. In particular in plants, um, their, their outer form is very variable. They can adapt themselves very much to their environment. So there could be two plants that are perfectly the same species, have the same DNA, but because they're in a different environment, they actually look quite different. That's the plasticity bit. So I think we're seeing an example of spectacular phenotypic plasticity. Unique adaptations appear throughout the Dolene. In the tropics, Trees are usually evergreen due to the absence of seasons, but down here they're deciduous with sparse foliage and narrow trunks. Dr. Muen theorizes that this is how the trees adapt to the comparative lack of water and shortage of light. These steep doline walls enclose this mini jungle and act as a natural barrier to the outside world, trapping pockets of life deep within the cave. Betcher looks for soil thick enough to lay some surface traps. Alcohol will preserve any creatures that venture in. Now she must try to find any signs of life in the dark cave. But so far, the chance of finding anything of significance doesn't look good. Could the acidic water that created this cave also be destroying all life within? In the wet, active part of Mountain River Cave, Daryl Granger discovers a clue as to why the apparently very ordinary water here has carved out such an extraordinary cave. He's got a hunch that the speed of the water at peak flood could be the key factor. Here, what we see are little scallops that are carved in the wall. They're dissolved in the wall by water as it passes by. He expects to find evidence that the water runs through here at a great speed. The faster the water goes by, the smaller the scallops. So if we see big, giant scallops, they can be you know, up to a meter across. That's very, very slow moving water. Here, you know, they're about the size, they're, they're about an inch across, a couple of centimeters across. From the size of the scallops, Granger can also figure out what's known as the Reynolds number, a crucial measurement that tells him how turbulent the water is. Like the acidity test earlier, the findings here are very average and offer no clues as to why this cave grew so big. He calculates that the water here travels at only three miles per hour a totally ordinary velocity for any river. Although Granger's drawn a blank on his quest, he might still be able to help Betcher on hers. He considers the chronology of the cave's life. 
I think what happened is the first doline collapsed, and it's acting like a big dam okay. right in the cave. Right. We passed that doline, and suddenly everything dries out. We yeah. don't see the same. Becomes sand. more normal. It yeah. becomes more yeah, of a normal, okay. less active cave. And that's where the wildlife comes in, because right. if it doesn't get flooded out every 10 years or so, it can actually, it has time to evolve. For Granger, the formula for how Mountain River Cave grew so big remains a mystery. This area has the right ingredients for a big cave. Unusually large beds of pure limestone and heavy monsoon rains feeding a deep river. But the water's speed and turbulence doesn't reveal anything. And Granger is almost at a loss. Oi! The surveying team looks for answers too. Oi! That's probably a 500 meter e echo. So if we ever push in a cave, and you get to end of a cave or end of exploration for a day, we often give it a big oi, just to see if it's still continuing. And we know we can turn around and come back to a, another successful push the next day. A bit further, Jonathan. For this expedition, they need to use a more sophisticated way of measuring the cave's size. Cave surveying used to be a primitive process where everything was done by hand. Now, digital laser readings cut out the tedious legwork and provide precise measurements. They must survey every part of the cave precisely, and every measurement must be exact to the nearest inch. When it comes to claiming the title World's Biggest Cave, it's length, width, and height that count for Howard Limbert and his team. The laser sends a beam across to a designated point called a survey station which Sims marks with a small light disc. They measure distance, height, and angle. It's painstaking work. 29.9, minus 3, yeah. 0, 0.99. Yeah. Left sight. Yeah. The laser beam picks out the highest point in this section of the cave. It measures 328 feet high. The Statue of Liberty could fit in here quite comfortably, with room to grow. The widest section surveyed so far is 338 feet across. This passage continues for another half mile. Enough room for a small plane to fly through. Or even a whole display team. Very good. So if we go back to the original passage. station, and then we'll get some legs straight down there. Okay. Can you shine your target? Shine on your Limbert target. believes this cave is consistently longer and wider than Deer Cave, but he needs to find the highest area. Just up a bit, Jonathan. Light on. They're now over two and a half miles in, and Deer Cave still holds the title of the world's biggest cave. Hope lies beyond the wall, but they have just three days left to survey, and there's a problem mounting. While the Dolines bring in light, they also allow weather from above to seep down into the cave. Jonathan, come a bit closer. Please. please, we've got a problem with the clouds now. It's extremely accurate if there's no cloud in the way, which there is in this case across the far side. Sir. This is one thing that does make it difficult, one of the peculiar hazards of surveying in a cave this size. The poor visibility means the team must stop the survey. It's a paralyzing setback. They're running out of time to get to the end of the cave. Time is running out to survey Mountain River Cave. Howard Limbert makes a tough decision. He sends his two best climbers, Sweeney and Clark, ahead to set the rigging on the treacherous Great Wall of Vietnam so the rest of the expedition can follow tomorrow. If they can't scale it, they may not finish the survey and we'll never know just how big this cave really is. In 2009, the explorers estimated the forbidding wall to be nearly 50 feet tall. Now, Clark and Sweeney think it's much bigger, estimating 200 feet, nearly the height of a 20-story building. They have the gear for the challenge, but the wall is going to be a longer, more dangerous climb than they expected. Geologists call this a flowstone, rock made weak and fragile by water dripping from the ceiling. 
the first 15 foot is this, which looks very good, but if you... <laughs> that's what it is. <laughs> this wall could be the mission's downfall. Yeah, right. That's just mud and gravel, is that? Ouch. It soon becomes clear this cave is not going to give up its secrets without a fight. It's just crumbling away. That's what? It's crumbling away. Tree and Clark have been building up to this for over a year. It's something that they're particularly interested in is, is climbing and climbing the wall. What we're climbing in is a very soft mud uh, calcite and so normal bolts would just fall out. It's going to be a difficult and exhausting climb. Back at the camp, the extreme conditions are taking their toll even on those who are not battling the wall. What can be quite difficult is just uh, just living in quite, can be quite squalid conditions. You've got to keep things clean, it's very dirty at times, you're getting sand and dirt in everything, be it your caving equipment, all this clothes, feet are a big problem because you're continuously wet or sweating or going through rivers. We often get uh, what we believe is a fungal infection of the feet. Meanwhile, Annette Betcher's search for life continues. She came to Mountain River Cave to find new species, but with only a mile or so to go before the wall, she has yet to discover anything out of the ordinary. She has one more chance for a promising new sample area, a dry passageway. That's where the opportunities are with this fantastically big cave. So I can go into those and look for those tiny critters that will be evolving in their large, dry side passages in their alcoves. Regular flooding in large parts of the cave means that it's difficult for new life to gain a foothold. But in these dry alcoves, Betcher thinks she may find isolated species which have had time to evolve and flourish in complete darkness. The smaller and more primitive the species, the better equipped it is to evolve quickly. Evolution takes a long time. If, if you have something like two or three generations a year, you can evolve at much greater speed. And mammals don't tend to have those generation times, so you know, a white blind bat um, in the cave is unlikely. Because of the cave's sheer size, species can easily get cut off from each other. In isolation, Betcher believes it's possible for weird and wonderful offshoots to evolve. Oh my word, look at these. Zoologist Annette Betcher finally strikes gold in Mountain River Cave. This is the first white woodlouse that I've seen ever in the cave. On the surface they would be dark colored, probably dark gray, slate gray or black. This is not something I expected to find here, so I'm very pleased. Come on. I'm almost 100% certain that this is a new species. And the reason being is that to have a new species, you need isolation, geographical isolation. But this is a pretty isolated place. They look different. There's nothing nearby that I've seen that's got no pigmentation. It's a woodlouse, all right, but it'll be a new species of woodlouse, and it'll be specific to Hang Song Dong. It's as, about as good as it gets. It's a fantastic discovery for Betcher, a species that has adapted to its environment and survived the great floods of water that helped create this cave. Well, there's absolutely no chance that anybody's ever seen these creatures before, and that's what it really excites me. It's a wonderful discovery. The woodlouse is a clear sign for Betcher to what's happening here. In the cave, the key to adaptation is being able to keep up with the ever-changing environment, and the organisms that most successfully adjust to the prevailing conditions have a better chance of survival. When I set off, I had actually fairly low expectations. So finding the white woodlice uh, is better than, much better than expected. I'm very excited about it. The woodlouse's evolutionary path has enabled them to survive and prosper in an environment never seen anywhere else. I would expect a cave, new cave species, probably to be pigmentless, so looking white to us and, and be blind. I don't think that the woodlice we found are blind. They seem to have rudimentary eyes and they can certainly sense light. 
So they are adapted to the cave environment, they just haven't gone the full way yet, so there is room for them to evolve more, and the next step would probably be for them to lose their eyesight. A once-in-a-lifetime breakthrough, Petra discovers new life within the Dolene. A breakthrough in evolution attributed to the awesome scale of this lost world. Back at the camp, time is running out. Climbers Sweeney and Clark continue in their battle to secure rigging on the wall and ready it for the rest of the team. If they don't succeed, the team can't complete a definitive survey. Limbert and the rest of the party wait nervously for news. As time runs short, Daryl Granger is convinced he's near to cracking the geological puzzle of why this cave is so large. Huge volumes of water, pure limestone, and a tropical climate are important factors. But it's not enough to explain why this cave is so big. In a bid for answers, he returns to his maps of the region. So this is a digital elevation model. It shows the area that we're in. Uh, right in here, this is the, the Kabong uh, National Park. Granger suspects the critical evidence lies in the cave's geography. He spots an old fault line on the map. It seems to mirror the underground route plotted by Mountain River Cave. This could be the answer he's looking for. You know, the real light bulb moment is when I saw the fault line and then everything kind of clicked. What I notice are these straight lines in here. They go due north and south. And remember, the, the cave here goes north and south. And I realize we're right on that fault right there. That's exactly what, what formed this cave. There's that same fault right up there. Once, a river ran where Mountain River Cave exists today. There was a deep vertical crack in the Earth's crust, a fault. Eventually, the river water eroded the limestone and went deep underground. Once the water filled the fault and found the exit, the river started to erode the rock along the crack, and a gigantic cave was born. But there's another key factor. The fault was narrow. When the water began to carve this mega cave millions of years ago, the narrow shape of the fault fortified the cave. The reason the caves fall apart, the reason they break down, is often because they get too wide and the limestone roof can't support that long a length. Here, the straitjacket of the geological fault restricts the cave's width, reducing the possible risk of collapse and allowing the cave to continue to grow in a straight line. The fault is very vertical and that has also influenced the cave development and helped turn it into uh, what's probably the world's biggest cave. And that's because the walls are perfectly vertical, they're nearly vertical here, and so the cave is very, very tall. The 1,300 foot high dolines show what happens when a cave weakens. Granger has every piece in place. Unusually thick, pure limestone, a huge catchment area feeding a large river, an underground fault line, the right shape to contain a stable cave passage. And finally, a river on the limestone surface that made a cave at the first opportunity. A perfect formula to build a gigantic cave. The title of the world's biggest cave could rest on reaching the top of the Great Wall of Vietnam. But first, they need to know if Sweeney and Clark have managed to climb it. Two and a half miles in, Limbert finally gets the news he's been waiting for. His team has reached the top of the wall. The height or pitch is even more than anyone anticipated. The pitch is, well, we reckon it's something like 80 meters. We've come up with about 80 meters of rope. 80 meter pitch? 80 meters. 80 meters. 
Great news. Yeah, that's his main objective this trip is to get up that wall, and we've done it this morning. I was very doubtful we were going to do it. I thought I thought we were going to be too tough, but they managed to go. They've done a brilliant job. 80 meters is a big climb in those conditions. The good news brings speculation as to what lies beyond the wall. It's a long way. I'm not going to be surprised if that's the end way. of the cave. Uh, I know Howard thinks it's going to turn left. My inclination is it's going to go straight there and, and terminate. Mm. But, you know, that's what we're going to find out. The final hurdle now awaits Limbert and his team as they push on to join Sweeney and Clark at the Great Wall of Vietnam. It took almost two days for, uh, for those guys to, to bolt up there. It's, it's very fragile rock, so you, you need to be very, very careful. They've done a great job. The greatest feeling was one of relief, which perhaps indicates how serious the climate has been. You're standing up there and you're looking down and all this, and it's, oh, it's absolutely tremendous. The team finally arrives at the wall. It towers above them. This is what they've been working for, their ultimate destination. Limbert and Jonathan Sims are looking for a section of the cave that beats the highest point in Deer Cave. They haven't found it yet. And if they can't get up the wall, they'll never know how tall the cave really is. It will be very, very dangerous. So we'll have to be very, very cautious going up the wall. It's, it's only for experienced cavers, really. Limbert makes a difficult decision. Only the surveying team will go up the wall. It's too dangerous for Granger and the film crew to follow. This is it. We're about to go up and push into the unknown, as it's as they say. Who's going up first, then? Sweeney. Ready to rock. You just have to hold a bit of tension for the first bit. We're all on tenterhooks waiting to get over this wall to see what's next. The film crew rigs one of the caber's helmets with a camera to record the climb. They can only watch as Limbert leads the team up on the final stage of the journey. It's a whole team effort. I mean, it isn't just uh, a few people going up a wall. It's, it's the whole build-up. It's the sort of a year of planning. It's all the prep. It's the porters. It's absolutely everything that uh, gives a few people the chance to do something like this right at the end. The cavers attack the Great Wall. Absolutely fantastic. There's something else, is there? Look at that. They have succeeded in the most difficult part of the expedition. The Great Wall of Vietnam. This huge flowstone, nearly the height of a 25-story building, is conquered at last. But the elation is quickly followed by disappointment. As Granger suspected, Mountain River Cave ends here. An exit to the outside jungle lies just 984 feet beyond the wall. With no more cave to survey, the team gathers the final measurements from the top of the wall to the ceiling. The highest point in Deer Cave is 574 feet. They've just climbed 236 feet up the wall and can now calculate the height of the whole passage. 45.8. Yeah. Sims reads the final crucial measurements. Yeah. 188. Can you just do the height of the passage there, Jonathan? Yep, sir. It's massive. Absolutely huge. Absolutely huge. Finally, they get the readings they've been waiting for. It's 96.4. 96 96.4! That's incredible. Jesus. That's incredible.
Altogether, the measurements show Mountain River Cave is the world's biggest, with the passage continuously higher, wider, and substantially longer than any other cave in the world. It's a fabulous cave, a really, really fabulous cave. Really enjoyed itself. We had a great time, we're having a really, really good time. It's just mind-blowing stuff, is this? It really is, and it, it just doesn't get much better. This has been a tremendous experience for me. I feel very lucky to have been invited on this trip uh, to, to see the world's biggest cave and, and try to figure out the science behind this cave. Uh, just uh, very privileged and lucky to, to be along on this trip with uh, Howard and his team.